from New York. It took 33 hours door to door. Uh, I need you guys to be louder. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. That's from my benefit. Okay, cool. So my name's Brian, and today we are going to talk about uh, shipping Ruby apps with Docker. Uh, I did start a company called Code Climate. How many people have heard of Code Climate here? Oh wow, that's awesome. Okay, um, cool. How many of you have used Code Climate? All right, we'll work on filling the, the gap between the first hands and the second hands. Uh, come see me afterwards, we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're gonna talk about Docker. Just to kind of gauge um, what people's familiarity is, and I can kind of try to tune how detailed I get, who's heard of Docker? Okay, almost everybody. Um, how many people have installed it and played around with it, like either locally or somewhere? I would say that's about a third. And how many of you are running it in production? Like five, okay, cool. Um, so I'm really excited about Docker, like really, really excited about Docker. I think Docker is going to be something that all of you are using within the next two years. And so my goal in this presentation is to try to kind of paint the picture of why that is and get you excited about it too. Um, and we'll look at kind of what the options are for getting started with it today. So. Docker is a generic way to run any service anywhere where the any uh, is, is a little bit of an asterisk and it means any Linux service. So it won't work for, say, Mac or Windows services, but if you're deploying on Linux, which I imagine many of you are, um, you can use Docker, and it's a generic way to ship things around. Uh, and that's where the name comes from. It's a shipping metaphor. So you think of like cargo containers, uh, Docker is based on that metaphor, and you put your application into a cargo container, and then you throw it to the ops team, and they can run it anywhere. Um, so it's sort of two big components. It's container-based virtualization combined with a generic package format that you can use for any service. And we'll get into exactly what that means um, in just a little bit. So container-based virtualization is kind of what makes Docker awesome, and this is the big DevOps idea uh, of the last year or two, and I think going to be the big DevOps idea for the next couple years. Um, it kind of snuck up on a lot of people, myself included. So like a year and a half ago, I didn't really know anything about what container-based virtualization uh, was. But uh, you know, the Docker folks threw a conference a couple weeks ago, and they got a bunch of presentations from people who are using container-based virtualization. And apparently everybody who knows a lot of stuff about ops has been using this for a while. So all of Google runs on container-based virtualization. Pretty much all of Twitter, uh, all of Facebook. So the guys that are dealing with DevOps at scale are pretty far along in terms of migrating stuff to container-based virtualization. I think that's one of the big reasons um, why it's going to become so prevalent. And it scales up and down. You don't need to be running nearly as many servers as Google for this to be valuable. We're gonna look at how it can be useful even if you have only one server today or if you're just developing on your laptop today. But you know that if you use an approach like this, it does scale up. I mean, that's as big as it gets, right? So you can start now and then move up with it. Um, so there's a project that's been around for five or so years called LXC, which just stands for uh, Linux Containers. And this was kind of how Docker got its start. For a while, it was a um, sort of a wrapper, uh, a higher level, easier to use layer on top of LXC. And LXC was kind of doing the hard stuff under the hood. Well, LXC itself was built on other layers, but um, Docker was sort of the user interface for LXC. Um, it's chroot on steroids, so it means you get a shared kernel and isolated resources. So you can only be running one version of the Linux kernel, right, uh, when you're using container-based virtualization. So there's no like, okay, I'm gonna run this kernel with these kernel modules over here, and then I'm gonna do something completely different over here. Uh, you can do that with a full uh, VM sort of system that a lot of people run on things like AWS, right? On AWS, you can pick your kernel. You can't do that with container-based virtualization. But it turns out that if you're using a modern kernel, uh, that's fine for almost everything, right? You don't really, I mean, me personally, I don't really want to be picking what kernel I'm running. I'm not smart enough to actually do that. So I just want a good kernel that works and then deal with things that are a little bit higher level than that. Uh, and then the resources, when you're using container-based virtualization like LXC, 
or Docker are isolated. So you get a sandbox for resources like PIDs, uh, networking, and files. So the root, this is like the ch root part, the root on your uh, container will, is not the root on your host operating system. Uh, and the PIDs are different, right? So PID1 within your container does not have anything to do with PID1 on the underlying host operating system. Um, and then you can, you can do all sorts of fancy things with the way you configure the networking for each container. You can give it access to the host networking through a networking bridge. You can say, okay, this doesn't have any networking at all, or do you port mapping, which we're gonna see in a little bit. Uh, and you can also do resource limits. So you can assign CPU shares and memory shares to your containers to control how they work when they're competing for resources. Um, Docker is from a company that was called, used to be called DotCloud, and they kind of have a platform as a service that was akin to Heroku. And they were running this for a while, and the conclusion that they came to was, well, you know, I don't know if they said, we're never gonna be more popular than Heroku or whatever, but they, they sort of realized that the, the technology they developed under the hood in order to support running that was more valuable than the service they were providing themselves. So they made a pretty drastic step and open sourced uh, this project Docker, which is the next evolution of their uh, underpinnings of their platform as a service, and it's all under, I think it's either MID or, uh, MIT or BSD license, very permissive licensing, and gave it away and said, okay, what we're gonna to try to do instead is become a unified standard for how people use container-based virtualization. If we can do that, we'll figure out how to make, uh, make a bunch of money doing it. So they rebranded the company to Docker Inc. Um, they open sourced it, it's all in Go, uh, and it consists of two primary components, uh, or at least user-facing components, which is a uh, command line interface and a uh, server daemon that you run which provides a REST API, and those just talk over HTTP, which has some really nice advantages. Oops. Um, under the hood, Docker's at the top, and then there are a few pieces that kind of make this work. On the left side, uh, AUFS stands for Another Union File System. That's a component that Docker use, uses in order to store uh, Docker images, basically the actual file systems that make up the applications that you're gonna run uh, need to be stored somewhere, and AUFS is a layered file system that makes that efficient. Uh, it used to be that Docker would talk to LXC, which we uh, looked at a little bit earlier, and then LXC uses C groups and namespaces, which are some kernel level features. That's really like the weapons grade stuff that makes this work. That's like the hardest components to get absolutely right, uh, I think. Uh, and then, but, but more recently, Docker has switched to a component they open source called libcontainer, uh, which obviates the need for them to use LXC. Right now you can switch back and forth, and libcontainer is the default, but I think it seems like libcontainer is the direction that everything's moving, so that just simplifies the stack a little bit. Okay, so what do you get when you run your Ruby application within a Docker container? Uh, isolation, we already talked about. Uh, it's sort of ephemeral-ish uh, in the sense that if you're running a Rails app, usually the process that you're going to be serving your request from, whether it's uh, Nginx with Passenger or Unicorn or something like that, it doesn't really need uh, to keep anything over the, beyond the life cycle of that process, right? So we've kind of moved to these pseudo share nothing architectures where we're connected to a database and writing things there, but the process themselves are supposed to be disposable. Um, and Docker works really well with that. It, it does some work to try not to delete anything that you might need later, but basically you can throw away containers and they're gone. Um, one of the big advantages with container virtualization versus, say, full VM virtualization is the low CPU and memory overhead. So if you think about, um, you know, let's say you fire up VirtualBox on your laptop, and then you think about how many VMs can I run simultaneously on my laptop? It's like, well, each of those needs what? Like half a gigabyte of RAM at a minimum to kind of like run a full system, and they're a number of gigabytes each. So you can run a few of them, and that works fine. But with Docker, you can run hundreds uh, because you're not actually needing to store full copies of all these file systems and boot full instances of an operating system. It's more like running a process it's a special magical process that's isolated than it is running an entirely new operating system. 
And so they also boot up much more quickly. Um, if you are booting up a regular VM, you have to wait for all of Ubuntu to boot, right? That's just kind of the, the, the way it works. But with uh, container virtualization and Docker, the amount of time it takes to boot a isolated container is measured in milliseconds. So you basically can't perceive how long it takes to, to start up a new Docker container um, or throw it away. You get the small images with the AUFS layering, uh, which we talked about, and this lets everything be very, very high density, which means saving a bunch of money uh, and also saving a bunch of time, because if you can run all of your infrastructure on half as many servers, that makes everybody's life easier, right? There's always going to be things that need to be dealt with on a per-server basis, and having fewer servers is a win. So Docker has two components. There's images and containers. There are two main concepts. Uh, this is a little tricky uh, at first. I, I kept getting them confused. Uh, but the image is a saved version of something that can be booted into a container. So think of, when I say image, you can think of like a package. A uh, Docker image is like a Docker package. And then when you run that package, you get a container, which is like a process. Um, so it consists of a root file system that could be any Linux distribution uh, that's in there. And a lot of times, people are basing their Docker containers on Ubuntu, but you don't have to. Uh, and then also metadata within the Docker package of how to run this. So there's a configuration that'll say, OK, when I want to run this package, Basically, this is the executable that I should run, right? Pretty simple. It's just a little packet of JSON that's uh, sort of stored there. And then they get stored in a registry, which is kind of like um, a package distribution site. Uh, Docker runs an official one. You can run your own. Just like rubygems.org, you can push packages to it, uh, and they become publicly available, or you can run your own gem server. So if you want to give Docker a try, this used to be kind of a, a pain in the butt. Um, but if you're on a Mac, uh, you can install boot to Docker, which has everything you need to get started with Docker on a Mac. It actually runs Docker um, within a regular, like a virtual box virtual machine. So Docker itself can't run natively on a Mac. Uh, so the hack is, well, OK, we'll just run one VM, which will be our Docker host. Uh, and then we'll set up the client on your laptop to talk to that VM. And because it's a client-server architecture, the fact that there's a host running in a VM uh, doesn't really matter. So boot to Docker will take care of all that. You don't need to worry about it. Um, if you're running a Linux laptop or a Linux development environment, you can, uh, like Ubuntu, you can install it with the official Docker packages. But long story short, um, it's very easy to get started with Docker these days. So I mentioned there's a command line interface. I'm not going to go into a ton of details about what you can do with the CLI, but just at the high level, um, give you the broad strokes of the main operations that you perform. The documentation about this stuff is pretty good. I mean, it could always be better. But um, Docker build is kind of the key command these days. Uh, so Docker build is a way to kind of compile uh, a package from a directory. So if you have a Rails app, you're going to go into your Rails app directory and run Docker build, and the end of that process will be a Docker image or Docker package that you can then deploy to any number of places. And I'll actually show you that in a second. Um, Docker run is the next step. So okay, you've got this package, now you want to uh, actually execute it somewhere. This could be on your laptop, on your staging environment, or on your production environment. Uh, you can customize just a few things, so just the things that should vary between those places, right? So if you have bought into this idea of kind of environment variable based configuration, Docker works really well with that. Um, people who use Heroku might be familiar with the concept of a 12 factor application. Uh, that plays very nicely with the way um, Docker works and where that ecosystem is heading. So, what you want to do, I, I think, is when you deploy your application to staging, you deploy a package which you've previously tested on CI, byte for byte, you tested that exact package, and you promote that to staging. And then when, once you test that package on staging, you promote that exact same Docker image or package to production, byte for byte. And the only thing that varies between staging and production is the configuration in terms of the environment variables or potentially some of the things that your ops people need to control. So port mappings, for example. Um, you might run your production instances on a different set of ports than your staging processes. Uh, Docker run 
you give it, at minimum, you just give it a Docker image and it will run with the defaults, but also it lets you provide environment variables and networking configurations um, and, and resource limits. So you can set a RAM limit and then your uh, passenger process will never be allowed to consume more than that uh, amount of RAM by Docker. PS works just like you would expect, display running processes. And there's just a bunch of other things that make working with Docker images and containers um, a little bit easier. Uh, there's a public registry of Docker images, so if you need to run something like, say, Redis, MongoDB, um, RabbitMQ, it's, it's likely that somebody's already gone through the work to package that up into a Docker image, which you can just search for on the public registry, and then uh, Docker pull will download that to your Docker host so that you can run it uh, anytime you want. Um, then uh, Docker containers are, have a life cycle. You can stop them, uh, which will send signals to the processes to kill them off. You can look at the standard out and standard error using the logs command. That's kind of one of those 12 factor um, application concepts. Uh, you can look at all your images and you can inspect what's on your system. So we mentioned Docker build. How does Docker build have any idea how to specifically package your application into something that can be deployed anywhere? The answer is a Docker file. So this is a really basic syntax uh, that's been developed to almost like a DSL um, for just the, the few instructions you need to give to Docker to let it do its job when you're ready to um, package up an application. So this is an example of a um, complete Docker, Docker file for a Sinatra application. Uh, there's not much to it, which is kind of the point, um, but we'll look at the sort of the few different types of commands um, which are present here. The first thing is that every Docker file starts with a line about where it's from. So that that's means what image am I starting with? You don't really want to day-to-day uh, -day be creating an image from scratch where you have a root file system with nothing on it and you need to get everything there for it to work. That's a bit overkill. Um, so you can start with a uh, either a publicly available Docker image uh, and customize it or you can create your own um, internal uh, Docker image as a base for your company. And the Fusion Passenger guys have actually released some publicly available Docker images which serve as a great base if you're looking to deploy Rails applications. So that's what I'm doing here. I'll talk about those images in a bit. Uh, run kind of does exactly what you would expect. It's just run and then shell. Okay, add is a way for moving files from your uh, source code directory, your local directory, into the Docker image, right? So they're not, it's not magically going to take all of your code and, and know where to put that into your, um, into your image. So you can use the add command to move files between uh, your source code directory and the Docker image. Um, add and then dot on the line there in the middle is just gonna move the entire uh, application source tree into the home app web app directory in your resulting image. And then you need to tell Docker by default what it needs to run. If you just say Docker run and then the name of your application, uh, you can override what it runs, but you want to give it a same default. And this sbin myinit is a process that the Fusion Passenger, uh, Passenger full image provides that will start up your application. So that's just kind of part of using this base image. And then everything works by sort of exposing a uh, network uh, port that you, you're going to get access to. So most uh, Docker files will define that they're going to do a bunch of stuff and the end result of all that, it becomes a black box, right? You're just gonna say, okay, when this is done, we're gonna expose port 80 to the world. Uh, and that's how you'll be able to use this. So to the outside world, it doesn't really matter what's happening behind the scenes. The, you know, the network is the interface between these things. So this is a talk about Ruby. Uh, so let's look at what it, you can do to get uh, your Ruby applications deployed into Docker today. Okay, so I mentioned that the Fusion Passenger guys um, created some publicly available images to smooth this process. I strongly recommend using them, especially if you're just getting started with Docker. Uh, there, you can start from just regular Ubuntu, but then you're kind of back to square one in terms of 
well, how am I going to get the right version of Ruby on there? Am I going to use RVM or RBM or some apt, custom app repository that has Ruby 2.1.2? It's just not fun to deal with those things, right? So um, the passenger guys have kind of already figured that out for you, uh, and you can just leverage what they've done. They have images that have um, Ruby up through version 2.1, Python, and Node kind of already there. Uh, so as long as you're just dealing with those things, you have to do very little customization. Uh, they also have a build tool chain and common C-level dependencies like uh, libxml2. Um, so you don't have to worry about making sure you have the right version of that stuff installed. And the amount of overhead that you get through uh, building on top of this image, there are some processes that it's going to spin up by default when you use this, uh, this image as your base. But all told, that's about 10 megabytes or so of a fixed cost, which compared to the RAM usage of most uh, production Rails processes is uh, pretty small these days. So when you run it, I mentioned it has some processes that are going to take some RAM. These are some of the things that it can give you out of the box. Uh, so the MyInit process is what we saw in the Docker file as the default executable. Uh, MyInit is a, just a little Python script which handles um, booting up Runit, which actually runs the other dependent services. And then there's this edge case that the passenger guys have sort of found where, um, long story short, if you boot a Docker image and the root process in that image is your application, then that is going to become uh, PID1, and that PID1 is not going to be taking care of one of the responsibilities of PID1, which is uh, dealing with orphan uh, processes. Uh, so they wrote this MyInit shim, which, which does that for you. But for all intents and purposes, you don't need to really worry much about what that's doing. Um, but some of the other things that that image provides are core facilities that you kind of need everywhere, right? Um, syslog is important to be running because if your uh, Linux distribution emits logs, you want them to actually go somewhere. You don't want them to just get lost in the ether. Uh, cron is often important if you want to do something like uh, log rotation or something system level that needs to be done periodically. Uh, you can also just use something like Clockwork and deal with that at the Ruby layer, which is what I do. Uh, and then SSHD is kind of an interesting piece, right? So if you're running a Docker container, it's not necessarily clear how you go into it and sort of look around, right? Like, what's the inspectability? You can run a new Docker container with, um, and you can select a command like bash, which is very similar to, if you've ever done like Heroku run bash, you get a bash shell inside of a Heroku environment. Uh, you can do the same thing with Docker. You can Docker run bash, but you're not gonna be able to look at a specific container and say, what's this thing doing right now? Um, unless you either run SSHD or uh, kind of jiggle around with some of the lower level um, uh, container virtualization commands in order to attach to it, which is a bit tricky right now. I'm hoping that Docker will add a docker attach command where you can just say docker attach and then get a shell um, within a container so you can inspect it, but that has not happened quite yet. Um, okay, so now I need the demo gods uh, to smile upon me and <laughs> I'm gonna do a quick demo of this works, let's see. Can you still hear me? The podium mics work? Hello? Yes, okay. Um, so this is just my laptop here. And since it's a Mac, we're gonna use boot to Docker in order to get this whole environment up and running. I'm, I've already started that up. Uh, but basically, similar to Vagrant, um, you can run boot to Docker up instead of Vagrant up, and it will just make sure that everything's in its right place. Uh, and it will actually give you a environment variable that you need to set on your local shell uh, in order to configure uh, for the Docker client how to talk to the server, right? So this. Uh, address here and this port is where the Docker server is listening over HTTP for commands. When I run Docker PS, it just does a get request to the server uh, and says, okay, what are the running processes? And then the command line just gets that back and prints that out. Um, but because the Docker server is 
running within a VM, it's not going to show up. Um, it's not going to show up inside of my process tree. It's not running on my local box. It's inside of the, the virtual box VM. Um, so what I've got here is just a really simple uh, application that's a Sinatra app. And what I'm going to do is package this up into a Docker image and then run a version of it um, uh, for my own purposes. So let's see here. Uh, here's the Docker file that I'm going to use. This is very similar to the one that I showed on the slide. Um, the only thing I really changed here is just an optimization on these lines, uh, which makes better use of Docker's build cache uh, to not have to do bundle install if the dependencies don't change. Right? So everyone knows like bundle install can kind of take forever and you don't change your gem file that much. Um, for reasons that aren't particularly interesting, if you uh, push the gem file into your Docker image before you run bundle install, then Docker's able to cache that more efficiently uh, than if you just um, omit these lines, it would still work, uh, but it would do a bundle install every time. So let's start uh, with a Docker build. What I'm gonna do is this force RM, which tells it to, oh wait. Sorry. I am going to have it not use the Docker cache. You can actually see what this looks like if it's going cool. So here we go. Um, cool, so it's gonna run, it's running the bundle install, but I'm just gonna scroll back up to the, the beginning. Uh, you can see with each step, um, it's going to uh, run the command and then save an intermediate container. Uh, so it starts with the passenger full image. Uh, it's going to remove this file, add this file over here. Each time, it's actually caching the result in an immutable image so that when we go and run this again, it'll be much faster. Um, when it gets to the bundle install, it runs that. Now it's showing you the output from the command uh, that it ran and it finishes, right? So now, just to show you, if we run this again, it's going to be really quick uh, because, that way. <coughs> so I don't know why it actually went back to bundle install, but not that interesting. Um, what we'll do, now that we have a Docker um, image, We can see, uh, if we say Docker images, we can see the hello image is sitting on our um, local system. We can actually execute that. And the dash P argument tells Docker to map all of the ports that the uh, Docker image is supposed to expose. Uh, and the dash D option tells it to run in the background as a daemon, uh, as opposed to in the foreground and wait around for it. So, Sorry for the, let's see if I can make this a little bit easier to read. Um, Docker PS will show me what's running. So you can see that the image I ran was the hello image. Uh, it's running the sbin my init command. Uh, it's been up for 14 seconds. And it actually assigned a dynamic port to map to 80. So the Docker file said, I'm going to provide 80. That's where I have interesting stuff. And then uh, Docker, when you booted it, said, okay, I need a port to make that port 80 available. Because obviously if you ran multiple um, Docker images that all provide port 80, they're gonna conflict, right? So it's kind of up to your ops team to figure out what ports they want things to sit on uh, in prod, right? Most application developers don't really care about the port numbers and they shouldn't care. Um, they're just going to, that's kind of the contract, is the app developers provide something that exposes a port and then they ship it to ops who figures out how to actually run it in prod. So now, with this, right, so if I hit the root, there's no route there, so that's just the Sinatra not found page. And if you hit slash hi, it says hello Ruby people. It works, yay. Um, so what I'm gonna do quickly is just make a quick change, uh, change the code. 
you can see I've modified the application. I'm gonna run the build process again. Oh, now it worked with the cache. Um, so each one of these steps, you can see it says using cache, so it's not actually running that, that's why it's really fast, including the bundle install, uh, use the cache. And then when it got to the add, uh, it did not use the cache because the add step was adding a different version of my code into the Docker image. So this is just a fast recompile. I'm gonna run the same run command again, and the ports don't collide because it's going to assign another random port uh, to the, um, the new container. You can see we have this container over here, and it gives every container a name. Uh, it does, it, you can specify the name, or it will give you a randomly generated one. So in this case, we have uh, Romantic Hopper and Goofy Yoneth. Um, my favorite name is, it, like, uh, often I seem to get angry Torvalds, which uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can see this one's been up for two seconds, but it's running on port 49154. On port 49153, it's still saying hello Ruby people, but if we change the port to 49154, hello Red Dot people. Um, and what you would do if you were using this to deploy to production is you'd probably keep the old processes around, uh, boot up the new ones, switch your load balancer to serving up requests from the new port, and then remove the old port from the load balancer config uh, and shut it down. So that would just be a matter of doing docker kill, and it will shut that down, now it's going to be gone, or you can also address it by its name instead of the container ID, and it's all the same. So now it's not gonna be available. Cool, that is the demo. Let's switch back. Awesome. All right, so, okay. Um, so I'm super excited about this, and this is the reason why. Uh, as a Ruby developer, I feel like for all the years that I've been doing this, I've never really had a unit uh, to deliver my application in, right? So for a while, uh, I worked on an application that was in JRuby, and we built a jar file and gave that to our ops team. And for as many things as you can say about Java and it being scary and enterprisey, that was kind of awesome because it didn't really matter what was in that jar file. I could test the jar file, I knew that it worked, I gave it to ops and they could run it. The thing is, if you're on CRuby, that concept doesn't work at all. Um, I guess some people have done work to package their uh, Ruby applications up into like .deb files. I mean, it's just files on disk, so you can kind of um, package them up any way you want, but it wasn't ever particularly easy uh, to do that. So if you're looking for a delivery unit, you run into all these issues, right? How are you going to deal with things like Bundler? And what if your dependency, uh, your RubyGem dependency, actually requires something like libxml2 that needs to be on a system? There's no way in your Bundler uh, config, in your gem file, to say, make sure you have this version of libxml2 installed. But you can do that with Docker. Um, war files or jar files, we talked about that. Uh, you can't use those with anything except the, the Java platform. And if you use Docker, you can get all of this for any service, right? You can put Java code into a Docker uh, image. There's no problem with that at all. But you can also put anything else you want into it, right? So people are packaging up things like MongoDB as a Docker image. People are packaging up Rails applications as Docker images. And it's all just homogenous from the standpoint of whoever needs to run it. So this opens up a whole world of change in terms of DevOps processes. You can use the same image and container for local development that you push to your continuous integration environment. Um, one idea that we're starting to play with is in our Docker images, in addition to by default running the code and providing the application, creating another executable inside the image called self-test. So if you say docker run hello, and then you customize the executable and you say, okay, I wanna run self-test instead, the docker image is self-testing. So it's gonna run your uh, suite of tests and put out an exit code of pass or fail, whether that image is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is a really powerful concept. Then you can do things like taking that image, building it on CI, running the self-test, signing it on your CI server as having passed uh, the self-test, promoting it 
bite for bite up to staging, verifying it with manual QA and staging, promoting it bite for bite up to production, and really only having the environment variables and potentially your port configurations changing between those things. So that whole problem of, well, it works on my machine, or I'm not really sure um, what this is, you know, why this is failing on CI kind of goes away. Uh, and you can really get this um, uh, benefit of building it once and then running it anywhere within your sort of Linux ecosystem. So the fact that it doesn't run on Windows really doesn't bother me all that much. Uh, this kind of meets all of my needs. Okay. This changes everything. Um, <laughs> it's, you have to sort of stare at it for a while, but why I'm really excited about Docker is once you change this one component, uh, of your infrastructure, it sort of unlocks all of these other benefits through all the other layers. So immutable infrastructure is an example of that. Um, a lot of people, how many of you have used Chef or something like that to sort of configure your servers? Yeah, about like half. Uh, so Chef's great, but there's this fundamental question that's been nagging at me, which is why do we ever run Chef against the same server more than once, right? that only kind of leads to trouble. The first time you run Chef, it's great, because you run it and you know exactly what state it's in. It ran the script, it's deterministic, that server is in a known state and you're fine. Then the problem is you're like, oh, well, now we need to upgrade the version of this package. So you change the version of the package and you rerun Chef and sometimes it's fine, sometimes it fails and you need to iterate on that a number of times, but through that whole process, you're creating uh, indeterminate state on that VM. So the reason we run Chef against the same server multiple times is because it's too expensive uh, to actually throw it out every time, right? To throw out your VM every time on AWS uh, after every Chef run. People do it, um, but it's not, uh, it's not free, at least in terms of time, right? Um, with Docker containers and Docker images, they're so fast that you can actually throw them away every time. It makes no sense to, you know, uh, SSH into a Docker container and apt-get install an additional package because now you need this extra package. You're just going to throw that container away and build a new image which has the packages that you want. So you know exactly what's in all of your containers at all times, which is a really powerful concept. Um, then it gets a little more crazy, right? So if you're running all of your code inside of a Docker container, if you're running MongoDB, Redis, Memcache, Passenger, Nginx, all inside of Docker containers, and there's a host VM, right? There has to be an underlying operating system that all this is running on, uh, and a lot of people are using Ubuntu for that. But if you think about it, why do you need Ubuntu underneath? Right? Like, why do you need a package manager at all if your packages are actually just Docker images? Uh, maybe you don't need all of that, and maybe not having that can actually lead to a simpler and more secure system. Um, so you've already got a way to run whatever code you need. The host operating system is really just a matter of executing the Docker daemon and keeping things running along smoothly. Um, so there's a Linux distribution called CoreOS, which is exactly this. Uh, these guys kind of rethought a distribution from the standpoint of everything running within container virtualization, and they stripped out almost everything. Um, it actually auto-updates, so you never, like, just like Chrome auto-updates, you can have an auto-updating uh, host distribution on your servers, and it has almost nothing uh, on it except for Docker and some con basic configuration management stuff, um, which is really powerful from the standpoint of security, right? If you can just get an over-the-wire update of your host system, uh, it's not likely that that's going to break anything if there's very little running on the host itself. Um, so it doesn't have a package manager where you're going to be installing things and updating things and dealing with all that complexity. You just get an entirely new image and drop that on top of the uh, old version, or actually next to the old version of CoreOS, and then it just changes a pointer so that when you restart the, um, the box, it'll boot off the new version of the operating system. This eliminates entire class of issues. Okay. Uh, the Linux distributions actually kind of become unnecessary in the containers too, right? So the Fusion Passenger base image that we started with is based on Ubuntu right now, but does it need to be, 
right? There was nothing in my Docker file that was Ubuntu specific, and there's nothing fundamental about the passenger base image that requires Ubuntu. So you could run something that's much smaller than Ubuntu and get the same benefit. Somebody could take a micro Linux distribution like, say, BusyBox, and add um, Ruby into it and the few C-level dependencies that are needed, and now the size of the image for your application drops from hundreds of megabytes down to, maybe you can get that down under 100 megabytes, um, which is really powerful, right? So now you're like, okay, we're using Docker and we don't need Linux distributions on the host and we don't really need traditional Linux distributions in the containers. Docker just kind of shifted everything dramatically. Um, it goes further. You don't really need configuration management. If you're running uh, CoreOS on the host operating system, there's not much to manage at all. There's a single config file, which has things like the users that you need to um, have available uh, and the, the few different customizations, but that's pretty much it. And then for building the images, the Docker file in many cases is all you need. You can shell out to a bash script, so if you need to install a bunch of packages, you can create a .sh file and run that, and it can do a few package installs. But for most cases, you don't need to be using something like Chef or Ansible within your Docker file to install dependencies because it's pretty simple, right? We saw how many lines of code that was. And then if you go further downstream, this starts to affect things like the ROI on service-oriented architecture. So, um, a lot of people are talking about microservices these days, right? And, and which is kind of a new formation of these service-oriented design concepts. Um, they're great for a lot of things, but they're not a free lunch, especially with respect to deploying them into production. Uh, deploying five or 10 apps is generally harder than deploying a single app. But with, uh, if you're deploying on something like Heroku, it gets a lot easier, right? So I've worked with teams that use heavily service-oriented architectures on Heroku, and Heroku is kind of one of the reasons they're able to do that, because Heroku takes care of managing everything. You just say, okay, push this to Heroku, now I have my service running. Docker is going to unlock those workflows for any environment that you want to deploy into. If you want to deploy on your own hardware, you can start to get some of those benefits. Um, you can do behind the firewall installs. So uh, I know multiple companies that have products, cloud-based products, um, software development tools, that they have customers who are asking, hey, can I run this behind my firewall? Uh, for example, like the GitHub Enterprise problem, right? That's traditionally been a huge pain, uh, but if everything's running on top of Docker in production, you can actually just give them a Docker image and say, okay, you're gonna download this image and you're gonna say Docker run code climate, for example, uh, and you're going to get a port that exposes code climate. That's the contract, is it's gonna expose port 80 and port 443, uh, and you'll be able to get a working code climate um, from just that. So it really simplifies uh, behind the firewall installs. And then the kind of final frontier is a concept uh, that's sometimes referred to as data center computing. Um, so the idea of data center computing is that you're just going to plug in a bunch of homogenous uh, resources into your computing pool, and then they're going to be able to run heterogeneous sets of work. So when you need more resources, you should be able to call up your ops guy and say, hey, we need to double the number of you know, CPUs and RAM that we need. Um, but what it's being run for should be abstracted away uh, and just dealt with as a, as a commodity. Um, so there's projects, uh, CoreOS has a project called Fleet built into it, which does this sort of thing. You can say Fleet Run instead of Docker Run. And if you have a Fleet cluster, it'll just find a place that has the appropriate resources or the appropriate appropriate configuration to run that. Um, and there's also projects that are a bit more robust, like Mesos, which is a top-level Apache project uh, used heavily at Twitter, uh, where you can build a Mesos cloud and just say, okay, Mesos, I need uh, 300 passenger processes. They each need to have two gigabytes of RAM available and two CPU cores, and I don't have any idea. I don't even want to know where those have to run within our data center, um, but you've got you know, a thousand machines. Figure it out and just mix them together uh, in, into whatever uh, resources are available and then give me back a, a way that I can address them and add them to the load balancer. Um, so there's a bunch of interesting stuff happening in this data center computing space right now. Mesos, uh, Aurora is a 
massive project on top of that fleet, and there's a, a few others as well um, that are going to make it, you know, we're going to get to a point where even on small scale projects, you're just plugging resources in and then defining in a, in a declarative way what resources your application needs. Uh, and as long as your resources are always more than, uh, the hardware resources you have are greater than what you need for the software, you're fine. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so what's the status of Docker? Um, they released 1.0 finally a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's in production at a, a good handful um, of companies. It's uh, pretty stable at this point. Um, if you want to deploy let's say a Rails application on top of Docker, there's, some, there's still some sticky bits. Um, it's not necessarily that Docker has uh, rough edges so much as Docker has a limited scope. And what you'll find is when you go to deploy things on Docker, there are other problems that are not within Docker proper's scope that you're faced with. So if you are, for example, spinning up um, a bunch of Docker containers and you need to add those to a load balancer and then you want to do a deployment like I did on my laptop where you're booting new containers, you need to reconfigure your load balancer and drop out the new ones, that's not really a problem that Docker is trying to solve. You need a tool that's higher level than that to deal with that. Um, so this is where a lot of the activity is happening right now. There's a whole ecosystem of projects that are being developed that build on top of Docker uh, and make that type of stuff possible. Um, for the load balancer example, uh, there is a project called Hipachi, uh, which is a Redis or Etsy, uh, uses Redis or Etsy uh, D to configure, dynamically configure a load balancer based on um, whatever you need to be available. So you can just talk to a Redis instance and say, okay, these are the IPs of and the ports of the application right now, and reconfiguring your load balancer becomes as simple as running some Redis commands. So you can still do that with, say, Capistrano, right? As long as you can connect to your Redis instance, you can reconfigure your load balancer. Um, so there's kind of pieces being filled in at each layer of the stack, but the ecosystem is not quite mature enough yet where if you're going to run something on Docker, you can just say, okay, I'm going to use Docker and these other three components. Um, I'm a big fan of CoreOS. I think that that's going to be kind of part and parcel with the uh, default uh, Docker stack. And CoreOS also provides a component called etcd, which is a distributed um, configuration service akin to Apache Zookeeper. So you can keep all your metadata for where everything is and the environment variables you need inside etcd. Um, but even doing that is not trivial right now. So there's kind of a, a few like the exercises left to the reader um, bits. But uh, the reason I wanted to get up here and talk about this now is I think you can definitely use it for um, deploying, uh, for developing locally. You can definitely start integrating it into your CI environments. And the ecosystem is getting better and better every month in terms of how, uh, you know, it's really, the issue is not having options for deploying to production, it's that there's too many options. So, so many people have created projects on top of Docker that there needs to be some consolidation, I think, in the ecosystem where it's more like Rails and there's like, this is the happy path. Um, and that's going to be, I think, happening over the next year. Uh, but I will be very surprised if and the vast majority of people in this room are not deploying stuff on top of a Docker-based system within the next couple years. Uh, so it's a good thing to start looking at and playing with and getting, getting your head around uh, because it's going to have some really big implications all the way up and down the stack. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and we can do some Q&A. So I'd like to talk about development. Because uh, it looks like when you modify that file, you redeploy a Docker image. Um, so are there tools like using, say, Gar and files and watching it will actually? Uh, yeah, so in, so in development, um, right, so what I did there was akin to, say, deploying something out to a staging environment. So I had a Docker image that I built from a version of the code, I changed the code, uh, and then I built a new Docker image and deployed that out. If you're doing local development, what you would probably do um, instead is create a Docker, uh, basically make the files that you're coding in available to the Docker image. So there, there are ways that you can wire it up. So where you're actually editing your source code, you can make changes, and then the Docker, uh, the Docker image um, can kind of just access that uh, without having to rebuild every time you save a file. So it's, it's not really necessary to use something like Vagrant for shared folders? Uh, yeah. So you're going to, um, it depends on if you're on a Mac or Linux the way you would set it up, but you, yeah, you can expose through, uh, if you take, 
let's, let's put the Mac thing aside. If you're, let's say you're developing on Linux, uh, you can do what's called a, a bind mount with um, Docker, which is the dash V option. And that just lets you take a directory on the host file system, which would be your laptop, uh, and expose that into the Docker container. So you just bind mount in the, the directory where you're working on the code, and then that would be available inside uh, to everything that's running within the Docker system. If you have, if you're on a Mac and you're using um, Vagrant, then you have to do like another level of mounting, right? So you mount from the Mac system into the Vagrant VM, and then from the Vagrant VM into the Docker container. But it's also possible. So I have a question: How far would you take the abstraction for Docker? Would you separate out, say, a database from an uh, application server? In yeah. So. Um, I've seen it done a couple ways. Uh, we have a image that we can build for Code Climate, which runs everything within the same image. So it runs um, Redis, MongoDB, Memcache, uh, Nginx, Passenger, all within a single image. And you run it, and you just get uh, Code Climate. Right? Um, that's one model for production that's not particularly useful, right? because you want to manage your database separately, potentially on separate physical servers. Uh, and it doesn't really deal with things like high availability uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it, it is useful for, um, for example, shipping things behind a firewall. Uh, what I think is likely to be the case is you're going to have kind of different, potentially slightly different um, package uh, roles, depending on where you're deploying to. Um, and then in production, like staging and production would all kind of be the same. Uh, so sometimes people will say you can run one, you should run one process per Docker container. Um, I think for most use cases, that's a bit extreme. Uh, I would think instead about like a role. So you have a role of app. Right, um, and that probably runs. Maybe it runs uh, an nginx process, which also has a passenger process attached to it. Uh, but if you discover that you need something like Sidekick, or you want to run Clockwork and do a Ruby-based cron system, you could create separate images for those things and be able to deploy them all separately. Um, but in most cases, you don't need that flexibility. So I would lean towards. Um, Keeping things simpler to start, which in generally involves putting more into a single Docker image to begin with, and then splitting things out as you have need, uh, because that adds a little bit more complexity. So is there a tool within Docker to bind those ports together? Or can yeah, so, um, yeah, so Docker has the concept of links, uh, which is relatively new. Um, so you can say, OK, Docker, run MongoDB. Uh, and then Docker, now run my application, but make MongoDB available to it. Uh, and that's called a, a link. Um, that only really works if they're running on the same Docker host. So uh, I think for many use cases, it, it can break down pretty quickly. Um, but it can work for like local development. So you can run MongoDB in a separate Docker container, uh, and then use links to expose that to your um, to your app container. Uh, so it kind of just depends on whether you're going single host or multi-host is a big variable. Uh, but then you can always do you know your own um, your own thing yourself, right? So th this is kind of one of the sticky bits is like how do you tell everything where everything else is? Um, Docker lets you do the dynamic port binding that we saw in the example, but it can also do static port binding. So you can just say, OK, Docker, run MongoDB and expose port 27017 from the container as 27017 on the host. I'm going to fix that port. Now, if you try to do that twice, you're going to get an error. But it does simplify things dramatically. Because if you don't need to, th then you can uh, address your database from your app server and say, well, it's on this host, and it's port 27017, which is the default MongoDB port. Um, so you don't necessarily need to jump to fully dynamic uh, configurations for everything right off the bat. And so when you want to go to fully dynamic configuration, what tool are you saying patching against those? Um, yeah, so when you want to go to dynamic service discovery, there are a few options. There's a project called SkyDNS. Um, there's a project called, uh, there's, well, there's, so there's etcd, which can, can be used to sort of insert information about where services are located and configure processes. But you kind of need to glue that together yourself. Uh, and then the Airbnb um, team released a couple projects that are used for kind of doing the same sort of thing. Uh, Apache works for sort of TCP layer load balancing, but not necessarily everything um, can be done like that. So that's, that's probably the um, area where the, with the most options right now in terms of how you're going to do it. I'm interested to see what the Docker team does in terms of kind of unifying that a bit more. And it sounds like they're starting to work on that.
I would just share a few things that I played with. <clears throat> it might answer some questions yeah. there. One of the development tools, there's a project called Fig. It's like a little just Python tool that uh, you can write a YAML file that just lists like a few service containers. Like, so you can use an off-the-shelf REST container, say for instance, it's, there's really nothing you need to configure, it just exposes REST. And then you can tell it through a YAML configuration also just build your application's Docker file. So you put that YAML file in your, in your project repo. Just run the thing and it'll let you run all the services. Potentially, or you could just, you could run the thing on Docker host in, in production, I guess, um, or script it, as Brian said, you kind of have to loosen that stuff together in production still, I think. Um, the other thing that's nice to know is there's a GitHub issue. Uh, I don't know, I'll try to tweet you later or something, but uh, Fred Fitzpatrick of Mincached is working on a, a Fuse implementation uh, for Docker, so that it's particularly for uh, OS X, it'll be supposedly completely transparent, like Docker dash V, excuse me, not volume, uh, shared volume. That's, that's the biggest thing that's missing for us as a workflow, development workflow thing right now. We still use Vagrant to be our Docker host and share our volume, um, but it would be really nice if that comes along where it's just eliminate Vagrant completely. Um, but they say it's, it's close. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about uh, having Docker, right, for different images, so for example, if I have a database image, then would there be any, um, like, you know, cases where I might delete the image and all my data will be gone? And uh, yeah, so um, that's a good question. So with uh, Docker, by default, it will try to save things for you. So if your, um, your Docker container generates a bunch of uh, files on disk, it will keep those around until you tell it to um, delete those. Uh, but with a database, which is a great example, right? So database, obviously you need um, file storage that is, has a longer life cycle than just this, that time you ran the database, right? So for that, you would use um, bind mounts or volumes, so the dash V flag. Uh, so you would just create a directory on the host system. Uh, maybe it's a um, network attached storage or you know, high performance disks. Um, you would create a partition for that. Uh, and it would have a path, right? So it would be like slash data, for example. And then when you boot your MongoDB uh, container, you would say, okay, bind slash data from the underlying host onto the, um, into the container. And then everything just writes there. So when you stop MongoDB, uh, it'll still be there. You can use all of the um, conveniences that you might have available, like snap, uh, file system level snapshot backups. All that stuff just works because it's all running in the same uh, kernel, right? So if it was different kernels, then you'd have to get into things like um, NFS, right, to like share files back and forth. But there's nothing that prevents you from bind mounting the same directory into multiple um, containers. And the kernel will handle that uh, because it's basically just a process that's sort of sandboxed. So bind mounts. Yes. Uh, if I'm running Node.js on a Docker Apple or on a Docker container, how close to the metal am I? <laughs> Super close. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Brian, I have a question. Uh, yeah. are, so, are you running Docker in production, and and are you facing any challenges? Uh, yeah, so um, for us in production, we, we do have uh, that behind the firewall use case that I described. Um, we, are, we have shipped code climate behind the firewall with Docker, uh, and that is in prod. Um, so for our individual customers. Uh, that is like back on Docker 0.6, which is a little bit uh, crazy. <laughs> we were early adopters. Um, for uh, our production instances, codeclimate.com, uh, that's a project which we're kind of actively spinning up right now um, to, to move everything over to that. And we'll probably um, try to use uh, CoreOS for that as well. So we just have CoreOS boxes and at least at the app tier, which is important. Um, that's actually an important thing to note. If you're going to start using Docker, you don't need to run everything in your entire environment with Docker, right? So for us, we have maybe 10 physical servers or something like that. A couple of those are database servers, or a handful of those are database servers. 
those are probably going to be the last thing to switch over to Docker because the benefits are just not quite as extreme. Um, it's not like we're actually building, we would be building new MongoDB images and deploying them out on a regular basis. So those can just sit, they have host names and they have static ports and the app tier can still be moved to Docker and then address those the same way that it addresses them today. Uh, so we're gonna start by doing everything in the app tier, which is the, you know, the workers that do the uh, analysis on our uh, code and then the, the passenger processes. Thank you. Any other questions for Brian? Thank you.